So in the boxing gym, I'm able to control those OCD thoughts way better than I am just in my normal day life because all I'm focused is on getting better, you know, winning this gold, uh, being the best. So I might touch something and I might think about it for a minute, but then I get right back to focus on, you know, working on the bag or the mitts, whatever I'm doing. Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shiklistan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? I'm a little tired from running up the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum and beating up sides of beef. Oh! <laughs> and if you get that reference, you are old. <laughs> and there is a Rocky statue at the Art Museum. That's true! But that does mean we are talking boxing today. Very excited to learn a little bit more about the sport in a non aiba can't get their stuff together and and put on a, a tournament without controversy sort of but way. But don't worry, we won't go a whole show talking about boxing without getting to some of that later. <laughs> But first, we'd like to thank our Patreon patrons for keeping our flame alive with their financial donations. This week, we've put out our patron exclusive episode for May, which features Dominique Jones and moments from the Team USA Media Summit. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com slash flamealivepod. Today, we are talking with flyweight Ginny Fuchs. Ginny won a bronze medal at the World Championships and a silver medal at the 2019 Pan Am Games. At Rio 2016, she was the U.S. Olympic boxing team captain. One interesting thing, May is also Mental Health Awareness Month. So Ginny also suffers from obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. So we wanted to learn more about her sport, but also understand how she manages her disorder. Take a listen. Boxing, you are a flyweight. What is that? And what are the characteristics of flyweight boxers? Okay, so yeah, I'm the number one flyweight for the USA, which is 112 pounds or 51 kilos because we do kilos in the Olympics. And I'm the second um, lightest weight out of all the 10 weight classes, but I'm the lightest weight out of the Olympic uh, weight classes because there's for women, there's only five weight classes that can compete in the Olympics, and that's flyweight, 112. 125, 132, 152, and 165. Those are the five weight classes for women at the Olympics, and I'm delighted. Okay. So that means your flyweights are pretty fast boxers then too, correct? Yeah, yeah, because we're kind of little, so yeah, we, we're, uh, our pace is, is fast when we're fighting. Little and scrappy. A little and scrappy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so... Other technical terms, let's talk about the different types of punches. What are, when we're going to listen to commentators, we're going to hear like jab and cross and hook and what is all of that? Right. So he, a, a jab is, I call it my bread and butter. And so I'm south tall. So my jab would be my right hand. And that, well, if you know how a boxer stands, it's the lead hand is your jab. Okay. And that's what is mostly thrown in a fight because it sets up the other punches. Okay, so wait, and, you're throwing a jab with your non-dominant hand? Well, so, yes, you are. But for me, I'm actually a right-handed person. <laughs> so I am actually throwing it with my dominant hand. But, but traditionally, when you start boxing, your, your jab is not your dominant hand. Your cross or your straight or number two, they call it two, is uh, your dominant hand, which is the power, which is the power punch. So for but me, you, you box left-handed. I box left-handed, but I'm yeah. But for me personally, I'm a right-handed person. So oh. traditionally, if when I started, I would be an orthodox. So 
my in that case, my left hand would be my jab, and my right would be my power, my cross. But when I started boxing, I didn't know the difference between Southpaw or Orthodox. And the coach I started with, he didn't tell me. He just said, what feels better for you, this hand to jab with or this hand to jab with? And, of course, I was like, oh, well, my right hand feels better with the jab. So he's like, all right, that's how you're going to fight. And I didn't even realize I was in the left-hand stance till like, a year later. <laughs> so... It's kind yeah. of funny. It's like other like shooting sports. You have like I'm cross eyed dominant if I tried to do archery or uh, do any kind of shooting a gun sport. But this sounds like similar in boxing. You, yeah. You, okay. Uh, yeah. In a yeah, in a way, very rare. Like there's very r- few boxers out there that fight the opposite way of their of you know their dominant side. So what are the benefits of being a soft southpaw? Well, nowadays I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say there's a benefit, but back when I started, there because most people are orthodox fighters, right hand fighters, obviously. So back in the day when I started and I came out South Paul, um, all the girls I fought were telling me like I'm very awkward. They're not used to fighting South Paul, so it was it was you know I was awkward for them. So that kind of gave me advantage because there weren't that many um, South Paul boxers out there. So when I came into the game, um, I was confusing most of the girls. Or it was just difficult for them to figure me out. So that was the advantage I, I had. But nowadays, I'd say the playing field's kind of even now. I feel like, yes, of course, there's still more orthodox fighters, but there's now there's a whole lot more southpaws. Okay. Uh, all right, so we have a jab and we have a cross. What are some of the other uh, right. hits? And then there's the classic hook, which is a three. So a one, you've heard, I don't know if you've heard combinations that go through a one, two, three. So one is the jab, the two is the cross, your power hand, and the number three is your hook. And again, in my case, it would be my right hook. In an orthodox stance, it would be the left hook. So um, that's a basic one, two, three. It's a basic combination that is used, obviously, worldwide in the in this game. And then... You might hear a one, two, three, four, but there's different people that the four can be another straight, in my case, left, or a four can be a left uppercut. So the when it when it gets beyond three, people change what a four, what the four punch is. But a, but a one, two, three for everybody is a dab, cross, and a hook. When you're in the ring. Is there a lot of like relying on muscle memory to figure out what combinations to throw or, or I, I'm always curious because if I think that I stood in the ring, I would just kind of freak out and go, I don't know what to hit. I'm just going to wail. But you know, <laughs> there's a lot more finesse to actual boxing. Right. Well, you, you always, that's why I always say my jab is my bread and butter. Cause usually everybody goes out there and just throws the jab out there to keep their opponent distracted and just, give yourself time to figure out your opponent. So you most people always start with the jab, but it's, and that's why they call this, you know, the sweet science, like a chess game. Cause you go, cause everybody you fight fights differently. So you got to go out there the first time and kind of be like, figure out your opponent, see what they're going to do. And then, so yeah, muscle memory does play in effect in the sense that, you know, you, 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 you're, to figure out your opponent and then um, adjust immediately. And that adjustment is obviously, you know, like, okay, I see that they're they're moving to my left a lot, so I'm going to set up that. So that's like my game when I'm in the, when I'm in the middle of a fight. That's kind of like how I'm, that's how I'm interpreting the fight. Now, the, like, time, you know, when I throw the left and or my combination, that's where kind of the muscle, muscle memory comes into play. Okay. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does make sense. And Olympic boxing, uh, a match is how many rounds and how long are the rounds? So for both men and women, it's three minutes, three rounds. Holy cow. So how are you feeling at the end of that third round? Uh, well, actually, I, I always feel like my third round is always my best because that I actually feel like I don't get start like, I feel like I'm going to be better as a pro because I I feel like I I get better as the rounds go on. That's why I always say that my the last round is always my best. And I I swear you know I just feel it takes me a while to warm up. I say I'm always I'm always warmed up by definitely warmed up by 
the second, but the third round is when I feel like, all right, you know, where I really got my rhythm going and, and I'm feeling good. What other differences between pro boxing and Olympic boxing should we be paying attention to? Okay, well, pro boxing, they don't have the headgear. Now, men, the men don't have headgear in Olympic style boxing, so that's the same. But for women, it's, that's different. Um, we fight in 10-ounce gloves. The professionals fight in 8-ounce gloves. And then, well, this is both for men and women. Um, the, round, the amount of rounds is different. That's obvious. For us, we always do three rounds. For the pros, it can go up to 12 when it's for a world title fight. 10 for women when it's a world title fight. But men go to 12 if they're fighting for a, t- a belt. Women do 10 if they're fighting for a world, world title belt. And then the only difference in the, t- the timing, the three minutes is the same for us and the men. But in the women's professional boxing, they do two minutes. So that's different, which I know makes kind of doesn't make sense how we go longer and the professionals go shorter. But that should I'm assuming that's going to change real soon in the professionals. But in terms of punches that are allowed and f- footwork oh, yeah. that's allowed, like, that's all going to yeah, look the same. Yeah, there's no yeah yeah the scoring, the way they score the fights is the same. The ten the ten nine system is the same. Yeah, I I know the answer is two ounces, but what's the difference between ten ounce gloves and eight ounce gloves when you're actually wearing and using them? Uh, well, I've never actually fought in eight ounce gloves, but my okay. best friend Michaela Mayer, who's professional now and was on the Olympic team with me in 2016, well, her anchors. They say the eight ounce gloves is, feels similar to like getting hit. Uh, in the head with a brick <laughs> it's a little it's just yeah it's a little more compact of a punch than the 10 ounce gloves and, and so is getting hit with the 10 ounce gloves like getting hit with a pillow <laughs> no <I> was, <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday is getting hit like hit like a pillow but not as hard as a brick that's okay. the best way I can explain it yeah because I again I don't know I've never been hit with eight ounce gloves so I can't really say Something so to look forward call, to. She's gonna call us back in a couple years and be like, "Let me explain." <laughs> yeah, between yeah, the let brick me... <laughs> and the slightly less hard brick. All right, <laughs> slightly less hard brick. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk a little bit about OCD. Okay. You were diagnosed with OCD very young for mm-hmm. obsessive compulsive disorder. I also have OCD myself, and I think it's probably one of the most misunderstood mental disorders out there. Oh, very much everyone, so, huh? You know, everyone thinks it's about, I like things neat and I like things clean, but that's not what we talk about. So how does it no. manifest for you? And that's funny you, you actually say that, because I was trying to explain to my teammates the other day about that. So for me, it's with contamination fear. And so my, when, with me, a lot about, you know, like cross-contamination and, 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 you know, looking at that part of, dirtiness it's not necessarily how things look it's what I see touch whatever you know it's what I see touches something else that's kind of what my thoughts are focused on um and this is what I told my teammate the other day I was like look I, I might be a clean person like I like things clean and the feeling of clean but if you go in my room I'm not organized I'm messy like it just doesn't look like I'm when you walk into my room it's like okay wait a minute I thought you're like a clean freak but that I, that's not what that means. That means like, I will, if I think, I'll just give an example. If a guy thinks uh, like a piece of my arm touches something contaminated, then I go and then I'll go to the bathroom and I'll wash that one spot on my arm for, I mean, I have done this before for like 40 minutes trying to get that contamination off my arm. So, so that's where people get, or that's where people misunderstand about what I personally struggle with it's not necessarily like everything has to be in the right position in the right place and look perfect it with me it's more of a feeling and and of getting this grossness off whether it's me my belongings or something so that's what I obsess with that's why if I clean when I actually clean things it takes me a long time to actually clean one part of whatever I'm cleaning and um, that's why this disease is very debilitating to me because it takes a huge amount of my time focused on one certain thing. And, and, you know, and, and it's like I can't move on with what I'm doing or with my day until I get that contamination, you know, gone or clean. And, Do you um, so get that's the a, ruminating that's thoughts with it as well? 
well, yeah, like I will, like, like I will like notice something, touch something else and be like, oh, you know, that the germs have spread to that. And then I'll focus on that specific thing, whatever it is. And, and be like, oh my God, I need to clean that. Or when can I make sure nothing else touches that? I don't want to spread the contamination. So yeah, the, the thought, and that's, you know, that's like a constant thought, obviously, because it's impossible to not let things touch each other in this world. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, the thoughts uh, are are constant with that. So how does and, now- and, and those thoughts are what are what um, drives me to do these behaviors, is co- these compulsions of overwashing or or just obsessing about one little thing and continuously cleaning it over and over and over again. So how does that affect you in a contact sport? So I love you asked me that, and I. Uh, this is why boxing has uh, helped me actually with my OCD in a way. I actually kind of tell people boxing is like uh, therapy for me because when I stepped into the boxing gym, of course, those thoughts obviously pop up in my head, those OCD thoughts, but because my focus with boxing is, you know, that's, that's like my purpose, you know, like I've worked 12 years to get to the Olympics and win a gold medal like this is my this is my value this is my desire this is what I want so uh, so in the boxing gym I'm able to control those OCD thoughts way better than I am just in my normal day life because all I'm focused is on getting better you know winning this gold uh, being the best so I might touch something and I might think about it for a minute but then I get right back to focus on you know working on the bag or the mitts, whatever I'm doing. And I'm able to be like that the whole time during training or competition and stuff. Like I'm able to be locked in on my boxing. It's when I leave the gym and I go back to my room, my house or whatever is where my OCD thoughts control my, like more of my behavior. So how has the pandemic been for you when people are truly talking about contamination and germs and right. not touching one another. Well, to be honest, it kind of <laughs> confused me. Like I was like, man, oh my God, I'm doing, I was doing everything right all along. And I told my therapist, this. I was like, so maybe I shouldn't change my rituals. And she's like, okay, hold up. You know, don't let this get in your head too much. Um, yeah. Everybody needs to be extra clean right now, but <laughs> don't, don't, don't make it seem like you were doing everything right. But, um, so, and it actually, I was actually more comfortable going out to the store and stuff when the pandemic hit because everybody was more cautious and, and aware of, you know, things cross contaminating. So everything, you know, they were constantly cleaning counters. Everybody was wearing gloves. I was actually more comfortable going out to the store, but it, it was hard for me. And the fact that, um, I was stuck in the house all day, so the, and like the like being in the house alone or just having no like schedule or or or, or yeah, pretty much having no like uh, routine for the day is what's hard for me because then all my all my focus, all my thoughts, all my time is like OCD, OCD, clean this, clean this, clean that. So that's where the pandemic really hurt me, where it was because I was stuck in the house all day, so. It allowed me to do my rituals, you know, times 10 because all, that's all I could, you know, I, I had nothing else to do. And that's what my time was spent. I had, that was what I had free time to do OCD rituals. So that's where so, it became hard for me. Plus, plus I would go to the store and everybody took all my latex gloves and Clorox wipes that I've, <laughs> that I buy almost every day anyway. So that was another hard part. <laughs> everybody took my supplies. Does your OCD lead to anxiety or depression or both? Lead? Well, it's, it's more of the anxiety I get from the ob- observation of the cross-contamination or me feeling disgust. That anxiety is what leads, I guess, to the OCD thoughts and rituals. But me doing more of my OCD just causes more anxiety, too. So it's like it's vicious cycle. I get this anxiety, and I do the rituals to uh, bring down my anxiety, which it does at the moment. But in the long run, it's just building more anxiety in me from having to do these rituals. 
Does that make sense? Oh, no, yeah. It, it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it makes perfect but, sense. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, does it make sense to Jill? Because Jill oh, doesn't no, have it, the OCD it, brain it, in this conversation. Makes, no, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> uh, do you... And that can, and so that, and that can, all the, all that, and all of it can lead to depression because, in which it has in me personally, when it's gotten really, really bad, because I look at my life and I'm like, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to, like, I'm constantly in stress, anxious, in that, like, fight or flight state. And, I, and you know, it's like, it's like I can't live a peaceful, like, a, like my mind's always riled up. I just want to peace the mind, and it's hard to get that. And so I look, and so I'm like, I don't want to live like this. So that can, that can lead to depression. Do you think about or do your therapist work with you on, like, it's it's so interesting that in the gym there's the the focus and the ability to not have to stop everything and and clean but how do you translate that to the rest of your life Well so in in treatment and therapy we do exposure therapy which I don't know if you guys heard of so and this has been the most effective treatment with OCD patients is exposure therapy plus medication. And I used to take medication back in high school. And then when I got to college, I decided to get off it because I never really agreed with it or it was up for it. I kind of was forced to take it in high school. And I haven't taken it. Well, let's see, in 2019, I went back into inpatient. I put myself in back into inpatient treatment because it, it got to a point where it's never been before. It was really, really bad. So I made a choice and put myself back into inpatient right before, you know, everything got serious for the Olympics. And I, I got back on treatment maybe for like two months because I was in there for a month. And then right when I got out, I continued it for another month. But it started making me feel nauseous and sick. And so I didn't want anything to change, um, I guess, like body chemistry-wise before going to the Olympics. So I so I decided to stop taking it and wait till after the Olympics. But I have continued with the EPR exposure therapy, which I do with my therapist still today. And that is, so exposure therapy is, so my therapist will make me go touch dirty things like inside of a trash can or just the ground, anything that's, that I feel is contaminated. And then she'll make me which is still hard for me today and took me a while to do it. Once I touch that with my hands, she'll make me rub my hands all over my body, over my face to cross contaminate, you know, all the germs all over my body. And then I have to sit with that for a while. And then she'll let me go wash my hands, but it's only for, so in, I'll just give you an example. In patient, I only got five squirts of soap and I got three minutes to wash my hands. And that was, I know that sounds like what three minutes is a long time, but for me that was very hard. So that's just a, an example of the kind of um, exposure therapy treatment I do with my therapist, and and that a lot of people with severe OCD do, and that's been statistically the most effective treatment so far. And I'm still doing it, and I'm going to be doing it for many many years because I still got a long ways to go to get it in a manageable state again. Honestly, Jenny, no wonder you want to hit people. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and that's another reason why I say it's like therapy because it gets my. It's another. It's it's a way to get my anger and stress out about with my anxiety and about my OCD. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask a quick question about the training in the department store. Oh yeah. So the so, the, you, so the U.S. So, boxing team didn't have space during the pandemic, so they took over an empty department store. Was it just a big empty space, or was there still remnants of the store that you could recognize? So we, yeah, so I have lived and trained out of the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs since the end of 2015. So once the pandemic hit, you know, they kind of closed down the Olympic Training Center, and it's opened back up, and we used it for a camp back in last September, I believe. But then we had a couple of positive cases in the camp, so the Olympic Training Center got scared and was like, all right, no more. The boxing team can't train here. <laughs> so the last camp before this camp I'm in now, they were trying deciding what to do and we got to deal with this hotel and the people that own the hotel apparently own the old Macy's department store at one of the malls in Colorado Springs so 
they made a deal and was like, all right, you can use the, cause it's no longer, you know, Macy's anymore at the mall. It's just kind of empty. So we took that over and, and everything was out of the department store, but like you could still tell the ring, the place where they put the rings was obviously the place where the shoes were. Cause you kind of see like the shelves that on the wall, like it was like shoe rack shelves. Um, you could still see the checkout counter. Obviously, have all the equipment and everything was gone, but you could tell that that was like a checkout counter. So you could definitely tell it still was a it was an old department store. There's nothing in it, but the setup of the store was the same. And you probably had some nice dressing rooms to change in. And I was gonna say, they, and you know, we ha- we we ha- we after we train, like, we're all sweaty and wet. We want to change. It's like, oh, perfect. I'll we'll just go to the fitting room and change. <laughs> so, what is going on with qualifications? Because last I saw, another qualifier got canceled for boxing. Okay, so this is I was gonna, I was gonna say. So y'all are the first journalists that I'm about to tell y'all this. So yes, it got canceled. The qualifiers got canceled, which means. They are going to go to the rankings to fill the spots for Tokyo, which means I have qualified for the games now. Because Woo-hoo! I've, yeah. We'll, so, we celebrate uh, yeah. that. Absolutely. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, so and, I, and I can't officially announce it because they, like the IOC and the boxing task force for IEBA, they have to like, go through all the points and then send out the letters to all the indie, you know, all the countries, blah, 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 and tell them your boxer has qualified, blah, blah. But I already know from what they said, how they're going to do it, that I've qualified. Sweet. Well, not to worry. This is not this week's show. It's a couple <laughs> weeks. So, yeah. Weeks it'll, be, so. it'll be official by the time we air. Okay. Well, so, yeah. I'm saying y'all can, y'all can say that I'm <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Excellent. That has to be a relief, though. To... Oh, yeah. No, oh, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's weird because it hasn't really fully hit me because it's not how I saw me qualifying for, for the Olympics. But yeah, no, I mean, it's awesome. I mean, I don't have to go through the whole cutting weight and actually fighting to get the spot. I can bypass that part. So. <laughs> Man. Oh wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. So cutting weight. We've oh, we've been talking about Foxcatcher, the wrestling movie and book lately, and they oh, yeah. talk about cutting weight a lot. Yeah. How much weight are you usually cutting? Oh, I guess, and that's another difference between professional and Olympic style boxing. So I walk around at like one twenty five, one twenty three. Okay. So I start cutting weight like a month out of competition. Because for, for Olympic style boxing, you have to weigh in every day you fight. So I go to a tournament, I fight four or five days in one week. I have to weigh in four or five times. And the and you also weigh in the day of you, you fight. So you weigh in that morning, you'll fight in the afternoon or the evening time. So um, that's with, with professionals, you weigh in once, and it's the day before you fight. So you get a full over 24 hours to replenish and regain your weight back. We don't have that luxury because we weigh in, we fight, we win. We have to weigh in the next day. So I might have to go do another workout to make make sure I make weight the next morning. So on average for like during camp, I cut like, I would say like 13 pounds, the most 15. But on the week of competition, I, you know, I weigh in, Probably, I would usually weigh in at like 50.9 kilos, and then by the time I'm in the ring that that night, I'll be around 53, 54 kilos. But I, during the fight, I'll lose about a kilo and a half. Sometimes all the, you know, sometimes I'll lose like uh, after the fight, I'll weigh in at like 52 or 51.8, and I can sleep that off. But usually I'll have to go do a workout, or I just take a like a really hot bath. To make me sweat the ke- the rest of the kilos off, so I can make weight the next morning. Wow, I, I just oh man, yeah, that's that's, that's yeah, that's that's another. I'd say that's the biggest difference between professional and amateur, Olympic style boxing is the weight cut process. It's much harder in the uh, in the Olympics than it is in the professional game. Thank you so much, Ginny. You can find Ginny on Facebook at Ginny Fuchs. That's F-U-C-H-S. She is uh, Ginny Fuchs USA on Twitter and Insta, and her website is GinnyFuchs.com. We will have links to all of those in the show notes.
She was really interesting. I really appreciate it. And now everyone knows I have OCD too. Yeah. Well, you know, it's tough. I, I, you know, it's really tough. You know what? I talk about it pretty openly in my life. So it's not like my mom is listening to this and being like, I never knew this about you. You know, everybody knows. And I don't have the germ thing. Which is interesting. But it manifests, it's interesting how it manifests itself in so many different ways. Yes. But I can tell you that I have wasted so much time thinking things over. Mm. that'll make you crazy i rehearse phone calls before i make them you know i have i do stuff like that too i've spent mornings i i don't i haven't had a diagnosis of ocd but i have spent mornings where i've had imaginary conversations or practice conversations over and over and over again but i chalk that up to me not talking to very many people throughout the day right because there's there is shyness and that's Mm -hmm. Some people have a hard time making phone calls or things, but the, the compulsive rumination goes to the point where it's, it's another level and it gets Mm -hmm. in the, the the real question when you come to disorders and, and since we're talking about mental health awareness month is, is it getting in your way is doing the rituals and dealing with the ruminations. You know, Ginny talked about how much time she spent on it Mm -hmm. and the damage she did to her skin. That's the difference. Right, right. It just is a whole different level. Right. Right now, we've all been super germaphobes Mm -hmm. in in a way. But is it keeping you from living your life? Right. You know, do you do you spend three hours a day cleaning one section of the sink? It's tough. Why don't we check in with our team? Keep the flame alive. Welcome to Shukvastan. Our karate athlete, Tom Scott, competed in Lisbon. So he's got a whole weird journey like a lot of athletes still do because in karate, uh, it, he does the kumite section, which is the fighting. And there are so many spots that are automatic qualify, or, you know, you rank so high and you automatically go to Tokyo. And uh, the host gets an automatic spot. And then, but there's also regional spots to be had, but ideally you just want to qualify in rankings. Tom is the first spot below all of those automatic qualifiers right now, right? Do you remember this? Because he told us just stuff hasn't moved. So, and he competed in Lisbon, Portugal. In his pool, he won three matches, but he lost in the last round of his pool, and then he lost in the first repassage match. So, he's still ranked sixth in the Tokyo qualifications, but he, he's got to get continental representation because there, there's at least one spot for the Americas, and he is by far the top-ranked person in North and South America. I mean, if, if number six fulfills a geographic requirement how can you not go there so right. we're going to be we're going to be very optimistic on that one exactly exactly at the usatf grand prix deanna price placed second in the women's hammer throw and her best throw was 76.15 meters don harper nelson competed at the drake relays a couple weeks ago and she finished seventh in the 100 meter hurdles with a time of 13.28 not great, but it was her first competition back in That's a long, long time. So, that you know, nowhere to go but up. And race walker Evan Dunphy set a new world record for the treadmill 10K with a time of 39.02. Congratulations. I couldn't even do a treadmill 10K, <laughs> never mind a record-holding treadmill 10 That must be just boring, though. I don't know. if you have If you have enough stuff to listen to or watch... Maybe it's okay. And it's th- only 40 minutes when he does it at, you know, yeah, world, when he, world yeah, record when he time. <laughs> Beach volleyball player Kelly Clayson and her teammate Sarah Sponsel competed in Cancun at the end of April. They won several matches but lost in the third round of the main draw to uh, the number one ranked team in the world, Canada's Sarah Pavan and uh, Melissa Paradis uh, Humana. Kelly and Sarah are tied for 14th in the overall rankings among the U.S. rankings, because that's actually what's more important for them on their journey to Tokyo, because only two teams per country can go to Tokyo. They are in fourth place, but there is still hope. They are not far behind the third place team and not super far behind the second place team. So if if a lot of things align, they could go. If they went, they'd be the youngest team to qualify. So 2020 may not happen, but 2024 could be very realistic for them. 
and maybe they'll move beach volleyball to my venue in French Polynesia. There you go. You know, I'm trying to, you know, if we're going to have events in French Polynesia, let's make it a little mini village. Like in the winter games, they always have a mountain site and, mm-hmm. a, you know, a city site. Mm-hmm. Let's go, man. So, so you're saying put beach volleyball there. Put what else would you put there? Well, open water swimming. Oh, yeah, that would be a good one to put there. Some of the maybe some of the sailing. Maybe. Surfing is already there. They're talking about cross country running being put in. Run across the island. Have a little mini village. It'd be fun. I could be the village mascot. I'm ridiculous and small. <laughs> right off the bat. There you go. Roy Tomazawa published an article in the Japan Times about Tokyo in 1964, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And our para- uh, Paralympian John Register was featured in the Colorado Springs Business Journal for his work with soldiers. We'll have a link to the, to the article in the show notes, but it is behind a paywall, just so you know. And happy Mother's Day to all our Shukvastani moms, both on our team and out there in our listeners. Uh, that sound means it's time for our Atlanta 1996 story. This year is the 25th anniversary of the Atlanta 1996 Olympics. So every week we're looking back at some of the stories from these games. Allison, it is your week. What do you have for me? As promised, boxing and judging controversy. They go together like peanut butter and jelly, don't they? <laughs> so in 1996 in Atlanta, the big controversy came in the lightweight or flyweight division, it seems to be referred to in both ways for 1996. Floyd Mayweather, who has become since very famous as a professional boxer, lost in the semifinals to Severfim Todorov of Bulgaria in a 10-9 to decision. Obviously, the crowd was very partisan for the United States, but even most boxing experts thought that Mayweather had won. The uh, referee actually raised Mayweather's hand in victory. Oh when they were announcing the decision. So it was clearly problematic. We all know that Floyd Mayweather has gone on to an undefeated professional career, and he is estimated now to be worth $280 million. Wow. So the defeat certainly didn't help his, uh, didn't hurt rather his professional career. But what happened to the man who won that match, Serafim Todorov? So he uh, was a three-time Olympian in 96, He also is a three-time world champion, so he was no slouch going up against a very young 19-year-old Mayweather. But in the gold medal match, he became the victim of some questionable judging. Really? And lost that match in a match that people thought he should have won. And he blames what happened to him later in his career because the Bulgarian Boxing Federation lost all faith in him because of losing the gold medal match. So he lost financial support, he lost coaching support, and he attempted to switch to fighting for Turkey. The Bulgarian Federation refused to allow this, so he retired. And there was an article in the New York Times that caught up with him, I believe in 2019. And he is unemployed and living in a small apartment in a small town in the south of Bulgaria. And he said in that article that beating Mayweather was the worst thing to ever happen to his boxing career because he was always tainted with this judging controversy. Wow. So the judging controversies in boxing don't even just hurt the people who lose the matches. It ends up hurting the boxers who win the matches. Wow. That is amazing and sad. I mean, because it's kind of like that short-term gain, long-term pain feel. And not for any of his own fault. It wasn't his fault that the judging was crooked. Right. Unless he knew the fix was in, but we don't know. that. No, it was never a question of him being involved. It had to do with the head of the Bulgarian Boxing Federation. That was always the accusation. Never that the boxer himself was involved. When he couldn't fix the gold medal match, too? <laughs> <sighs> we know there's issues in Aiba, and there have been issues in Aiba, certainly back to 96, and a lot further than that. Right. Oh, man. 
crazy, crazy. Ah, uh, we got a bunch of Tokyo 2020 news. As we spoke about, I think a couple of weeks ago, Tokyo and I think all of Japan did put in the state of emergency and we told everybody not to panic that they were going to do this. It happened. Mm-hmm. Still don't panic. Yeah. And they're talking, they, they haven't made a decision on whether they will allow spectators at all. And they're pushing that decision back till June. But in the meantime, the media still says there's a lot of, it, it just feels very anxiety inducing when you read the news about yes. Japan and their COVID cases and the slow rollout of a vaccine. Although they are now up. To, I don't want to say, I know this is going to sound bad. Like, well, they're up to 2% of the population vaccinated, but just last week they were at like 1% and they've got a lot of people in Japan. So that's, I, I see progress. I am a glass half full person on this 2020 Olympics and 2021 happening. Or a glass 2% full. <laughs> How about a glass 2% empty? (laughs) But it's doubly full from last week. (laughs) That's right. I'm going with it. So the rest of the version two of the playbooks came out and they're pretty much the same. These are for like broadcasters and marketing partners and Olympic family members. The short answer is stay away. Stay far, far away. Yeah. Be prepared to test before, test during quarantine when you get there have a plan stick to your plan and broadcasters so this was the one one tidbit i thought was interesting from the broadcaster playbook under no circumstances should any broadcaster or member of its staff approach an athlete for autographs and pictures which i thought that was fascinating but there's a lot more coordination of interviews and access so Rights holding broadcasters, apparently, there's there's a media section within the village and there's going to be a residential zone. And if you're a broadcaster, you have to coordinate more with the National Olympic Committee or Paralympic Committee that you're trying to get your interview with the, the athlete that you're trying to interview. But you cannot go into that residential zone at all. And the members of the press have to book access to the venues every day and nobody, you can't be a, a spectator at any venue if you're a broadcaster or member of the press you cannot say oh i have a ticket i'm going to watch as a spectator so they are trying to do their best to keep everybody separate from general public and keep the athletes separate from all of the people who have to help them out the organizing committee is this was a this was a little bit of a hullabaloo this was a little tone deaf Uh, The organizing committee is looking for 200 volunteer sports medicine doctors and 500 volunteer nurses. And boy, all over the the Japanese press, the nurses are not happy. Don't take our nurses. Yeah, exactly. They're busy with COVID. And apparently, you know, they're very worried about the prevalence of coronavirus in the country. So they're also, and they're also having to work hard. Maybe organizing committee... The medical staff, maybe you don't provide or you start asking the National Olympic Committees who are bringing staff to, hey, can you chip in? I mean, because who is giving the shots to make that 1%, 2%? It's nurses. Yeah, depending. And, and they're also busy caring for people who have COVID plus whatever other sicknesses and problems are happening in the country. You know, you have an accident, you need a nurse. I am curious how they will staff this situation. It's that's a lot of nurses. It's a lot. It's a big medical staff to have, and I get that they're working in shifts, but right. But it, given how few spectators and how few staff, mm-hmm. do we really need seven hundred volunteer medical officers? Yeah, I don't know. Unless they were like, oh, we need, we need this many because everybody's going to take one or two shifts. That's Maybe, possible. You know. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Vaccination-wise, uh, the Japan News reported that the IOC estimates 60% of overseas athletes will be vaccinated before the Games. And I think most of the U.S. athletes will have vac- vaccinations. A, a, lo- a good deal of the South Korean team, I think, will have vaccinations. Australia has announced that they will vaccinate their athletes. I think in some countries, 
the vaccine rollout is working in their favor. So by the time July hits or by the time an athlete needs to go to Japan, they will have the opportunity. Not that case in every country, but at least you'll have some, you're, you're not dealing with a, a zero base there. So that's good news. A little bit of Mero Novella. I feel like I should hum. <laughs> they had the test event up in uh, Sapporo with a few foreign participants, but mostly Japanese runners. They ran along the half marathon route to test it out. Uh, Sebastian Coe was there to give his stamp of approval. They were not supposed to have spectators, but there were few. There were a few along the route because they they had signs up saying "People stay home," but some spectators, some protesters, but nothing huge. But they had a pretty good event, and it wasn't hot in Sapporo. No, it I was guess. not hot. No, it was not hot. Canadian grocer Empire Company, which operates under the store banners Sobeys, IGA, Safeway, Foodland, Thrifty Foods, and Voila is Team Canada's first ever grocer. So they have started the Feed the Dream movement, which if you're one of our Canadian listeners, you will start seeing some more in-store marketing about this. We would be very excited to hear about said in-store marketing, if it is cool or not. Uh, Are they letting us back into Canada yet? No, not yet. Oh, because I would totally go to Feed My Dream. (laughs) I'm going to feed my dream after we finish taping. <laughs> Voila. Lunch. But part of the part of this deal is that they're giving Olympic qualified athletes grocery cards to use for purchasing healthy food, which is very nice. You, you know? know what? Some of those athletes spend a ton of money trying to get the right nutrition. So those grocery cards and and we know they live on poverty wages. Right, so, those so many of them. cards can make a huge difference. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a that's a really cool partnership that I wanted to talk about. The Paralympic Committee is announcing a Samsung Paralympic Vloggers competition. I think they had something like this for Rio as well. They may have had both Olympic and Paralympic. They chose some of the athletes to be vloggers during the games, and they will use those to uh, show different feats and performances that the games delivers. They'll have four vloggers total who will produce content for their own channels and uh, during the games. So that's something cool to look out for. Or they did this, they might have done this during Pyeongchang because I do remember that. And lastly, I thought this was cool. The Kyoto News reported the winners from a recipe contest that the Tokyo Organizing Committee held last year the top five dishes out of 700 plus entries will be served at the athlete's village. Now, did this article include actual recipes? Like, can we make these at home for our viewing pleasure? Sadly, no. Oh, that's disappointing. Right. And, And a lot of the recipes seem to be variations on something traditional. So, uh, the first one was cold somen noodles, and usually that is served in a light soup stock with condiments, but instead these will be served with chicken and vegetables in a tomato broth to give extra nutrition for athletes. Uh, the second one is odin, which is usually a hot pot, but this time it's going to be a chilled soup with tomatoes, summer vegetables, and what they call typical ingredients like processed fish cakes. For dessert, they will have zunda de panna cotta, with, Which does not sound Japanese. <laughs> just, just a thought. With with uh, sweetened mashed green soybeans, and that's used in northeastern Japan. Uh, the fourth dish will be zangi, which is deep fried salmon that is from the northernmost main island of Hokkaido. And finally, there will be toasted bread with peaches, ham, and cream cheese. Huh. Interesting. I wonder if the peaches and ham combination is kind of like the Hawaiian pizza with pineapple and ham. Yeah. Like I was th- going, oh, they're doing the creamy, salty, sweet mm-hmm. all together. I'm very, I would be curious to test. I mean, because cream better. cheese and peaches sounds fantastic. It is one of the few things that they can still do that they had planned to do before the pandemic. We can make food. We can feed you. <laughs> we have a new book for book club. 
It is called Seven's Heaven, The Beautiful Chaos of Fiji's Olympic Dream by Ben Ryan, who coached the Fiji team to victory in rugby's return to the Olympics at Rio 2016. We had the opportunity to interview Ben this past week, and Book Club Claire was able to join us as well. And she asked Ben some questions about the book. Take a listen. All right, we have Ben Ryan, author of Seven's Heaven, The Beautiful Chaos of Fiji's Olympic Dream. He's going to tell us a little bit more about the book so that you guys get inspired to read it for our next book club selection. Ben, thank you for joining me today. That's great to be here. Uh, what led you to write about your experiences in this book? I guess it, it was from finishing my time in Fiji and, co and coming back to London um, that uh, I started telling people about some of the stories and some of the friends that were close to me kept telling me that this was a, this was a story that needs to be written down and remembered and shared. And that's, that's exactly what happened. And uh, uh, along with a, a mate of mine that I went to Cambridge University with called Tom Fordyce, um, he kind of ghost wrote the book and, uh, and we produced a book that we're really proud of. What do you want readers to learn about the Fiji heritage and culture, especially for those that might not know anything about the country? Yeah, I think, I think the book, don't be put off by thinking, oh, this, this is a book about rugby. I have, I have zero interest in that. It, it's about people and it's about, um, it's about trying to help people become their best versions and, and how Fiji helped me become my best version, I guess. Um, it's about me moving from first world to third world. It's, it's about me going from a very rich um, sporting body in, in the UK to um, a bankrupt one in Fiji. It's going to, to, to talking about, you know, people following their dreams and getting the first medal ever in Olympic history for, for a Fijian. Um, and it's all wrapped around friendships and um, people, really. So um, I think if you have zero interest in rugby, zero interest in professional sport, you'll find it a good read. What do you think could be done to bring more Olympic successes to smaller countries like Fiji? Gosh, it's a good question. I mean, it often, um, you know, I, I, it's the same but different when I'm working, mentoring in, in, in London and, and helping kids try to um, become their best versions. It's about opportunity. It's providing uh, opportunity and resource and support um, for these smaller nations. And then finding a niche, maybe. So, so for in, in Olympic terms, the niche for Fiji is rugby sevens at the moment. You know that that's a sport that they can they can rightfully say they're they're the best in the world at. Um, and for for other nations, you know, there might be there might be other sports that they might have an opportunity for. Fiji's next sport really should be um, track and field four hundred meters. You know, we have incredible athletes. It's one of the biggest. Um, athletics events in the world for it's actually the biggest for for for, chill, for um schools mm -hmm. you know it's live on tv it's forty five thousand people in this in the national stadium it goes bonkers it's crazy it's bigger than the jamaican national athletics um championships at schoolboy level schoolgirl level but then it all stops then there's a ceiling there's nothing else for them to go to so you know i was helping out one of our athletes that was a 400 meter hurdler that, that had qualified for the Olymp for the previous commonwealth games was trying to qualify for the Olympics. And I said, who's your coach? And he said, it's the internet. And so, so I was like, okay, yeah, you know, it's, it's the, they're, that it's lack of resource. And I think given the opportunity, you know, they, they definitely would, there'd be more medalists out there in, in the South Pacific islands. You're kind of speaking my language when you bring up track and field like that. <laughs> That's my favorite uh, sport. Me too. Hey, look, I'm crazy about track and field. Um, watched every day that I could, I could after the uh, after our events in Rio and the same in London. Um, my dad was uh, uh, just on the edges of international athletics as well, and um, used to renade me stories about you know the 40s and 50s and uh, of athletics and and all of those people. I've got. The programs from every day at the London Olympics and 52 Helsinki. My dad was at both of those games in the Olympic Village. He kind of said he was a reserve, but I don't actually think that exists. But he somehow managed to get himself into the village and stayed there. Um, and he was, a, you know, a national standard javelin thrower. So he would tell me all those stories. And I use some of those um, in my coaching. Herb Elliott, who, who I'm sure you've heard of, who was like a middle distance star in from australia you know i use some of the concepts that his coach percy ceruti used in uh, running up and down sand dunes with his with her in the 50s that was something the fijian boys used to, you know for their 
a quest to get an Olympic gold medal. Awesome. Well, that's that's my portion. So thank you very much. It's just worth mentioning maybe that the book, the rights for the book have been sold now. So there is a film that's that's in progress at the moment. Um, a script has been written and it's based loosely on the on the book and and the Olympic story for Fiji. But it's you know it's a it's a big budget feature film. That is going to be exciting. Do you uh, do you get any information about the movie as it's being developed, or because you sold the rights, it's kind of off your plate? No, I get a little bit. I'm kind of classed as executive producer. That that, that means absolutely nothing. But um, it does mean I get to hear a few things. Not a lot. All I know at the moment is that you know the funding's there and the script's been written and they they kind of in a long queue of films that are waiting to be filmed when COVID allows us. Okay, so I had heard this. I saw you mention this in an interview, and I have already made a list of who should play you. Okay. So my my first choice was Damian Lewis. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Makes sense. You know. You're yeah. Going ginger here. Uh, my second choice was Owen Hunt. Owen another... Hunt. I don't know yeah, Owen he Hunt. In, he was in Grey's Anatomy here in the states, but he's okay. Scottish actually. And then my my favorite choice was actually to- Tony Curran, who's another Scott. Oh, again, don't know a lot him. Of, a Brits on Brit TV. So you know, I'm going to throw this out there. Yeah. No, they they I've no, not heard of two of those. That, that's terrible, I know, but I'll have to. I'm sorry, I'm well, just. You've been a little oh, busy. I saw Tony Curran last night on telly. He's in um, the Looming Towers. Yeah, he's very ginger. I mean, he's uber ginger. <laughs> You're like beyond. He's like, yeah. <laughs> okay, what's very ginger as opposed to regular ginger? Well, well when I was when I, I mean, I, 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 my mum and my dad were both redheads. So you know, there was and my both my sisters have very bright red hair as well. Um, and but when I was younger, it it was super bright. I mean, you know, illuminous almost. And and he's got that with the beard still. So he's kind of double hit. Um, it, it's um, it's certainly a very uh, it's a look that's for sure. So yeah, uh, that would be what I'd class as super ginger. <laughs> So, hey, he's in, he's in employment. He's got work. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. You can get your copy of 7-7 at bookshop.org slash shop slash flame alive pod we get a commission from books purchased through our link and that goes toward funding our on the ground coverage at beijing 2022 book club will happen after the paralympics so you've got plenty of time to read it but you don't want to miss it i have started it and it is an entertaining read so far i'm very excited we will have been on the show in June uh, talking to us about how rugby works and also his experiences coaching the Fiji team. So do not miss that conversation coming up in June. And if the book is half as charming as the author, we are going to have fun in book club. <laughs> Quick little bit of news from the International Olympic Committee. They have relaunched their website as olympics.com. And it's a little cleaner. I haven't had a ton of time to dive into it, but it looks a little cleaner than it has been. Has a lot of videos, has a lot of past games information together with old clips and uh, athletes, sports, and news. So basically, it's just one big giant rabbit hole that they've created for us. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and I think Thanks, they've combined Diva. they've combined things because like it's it's easier to find information about the museum and uh other elements of the IOC and future games as well. So that is something to dig into when you have, you know, like five hours to spare. <laughs> that will do it for this week. Let us know what you think about boxing email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. We're Flame Alive Pod on Twitter and Insta and keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. Join us next week to learn about para-dressage with Sydney Collier. And if you think dressage is a boring sport, think again. You will be fascinated by Sydney's story and how she describes the sport. So as we go out to music by Archdale, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.
They go together like peanut butter and jelly, don't they? <laughs>